Lucius Vedius, professional informant, died of natural causes 59 BCE. An equestrian who was once a close associate of the notorious Lucius Sergius Catalina, better known as Catiline in the English tradition, Lucius Vedius managed to captivate the Roman ruling class for about a week due to his wild allegations against many of the most prominent senators. Vedius's claim, in effect, is that there was a widespread conspiracy aiming to murder Gnaeus Pompey the Great, Rome's most powerful citizen and a member of the First Triumvirate. After two days of delivering contradictory testimony about this plot, Lucius Vedius was found dead in his jail cell. This, of course, immediately made the Vedius affair a matter subject to much speculation. For instance, was Vedius acting alone, or was he a puppet whose strings were being pulled by a major politician or faction? While it is not impossible that Vedius did die of natural causes, it does seem highly likely that his life was artificially shortened. Who, then, was most likely responsible for Vedius's sudden cessation of biological function? Finally, we must consider the larger significance of this strange episode to both the consulship of Julius and Caesar and to the era of the First Triumvirate in a broader sense. What follows is the closest approximation to the Jeffrey Epstein case that the Roman Republic ever produced. Of all the Romans I've covered in this series so far, Lucius Vedius may very well be the most poorly attested of the lot. We know almost nothing about the man aside from his appearance in two episodes of Roman history. He appears as an informant in the Catalinarian conspiracy, and he appears again when he is questioned during his own hearings. The only other thing that we know about him for certain is that he was a member of the Equestrian Order. The Equestrian Order was the second highest ranking group of people in the Roman world. They're kind of a sub-nobility, so they're not quite eligible for the Senate, but at the same time, they are people who are leisured and wealthy. If you were an Equestrian, you would never truly work a day in your life, at least not in the sense that most normal people think of work. You might be a high-ranking businessman or a major merchant, but you certainly would not be a craftsman or a small farmer. That being said, the level of wealth among the equestrians could vary quite a bit, even more so than the wealth gaps between different senators. And I'm willing to bet that Vedius would have been on the lower end of that wealth scale. That being said, even as someone on the lower end, he most likely still received just about the same education as someone like a Cicero or a Caesar. Roman classrooms, after all, had to fill up to some extent, and most equestrians wanted to have a good education so they could be socially viable when dealing with senators at parties and things like that. And they also wanted to make sure that they could speak Greek so when they went off on business ventures to the East, they could make connections. And part of the reason that we know equestrians were that educated is because Many of the great scholars and poets were actually equestrians rather than senators, such as the love poet Catullus, who was active in this era as well. When it comes to Vedius, he most likely was not only on the poorer end of the equestrian order, but also somewhat hard up for funds. We suspect this because not only does he appear as an informant trying to sell information for money, which is kind of a giveaway that he might not be the most financially secure person, but he also is friends with Lucius Sergius Catalina, or Catiline, and Catiline was someone who pretty much built his political career, at least in the last phase where he's trying to seek the consulship, about debt cancellation. So many of the people who surrounded Catiline were people who had financial difficulties and were looking to wipe the slate clean. When it comes to about how old Lucius Vedius was, we can't really be certain. Catiline himself was about 45 or 46 when he died in action in 63 or early 62. Vedius might have been about that age, but also because Catiline tended to associate with younger men, it's possible that Vedius was only in his 20s, even in 59. And another piece of evidence that might suggest he was only in his uh, 20s is that the person he chose to approach with his supposed information was a young Gaius Scribonius Curio, 
who was just now making a name for himself as an orator and would have been in his mid to late 20s at the time. Um, it would have been a little more natural for Vedius to approach him if they were about the same age and had some reason to be interacting rather than if he were old enough to be the man's father and was just approaching him about a plot. We don't know exactly when Vedius and Catiline became good friends, but most likely their friendship had gone back a few years and Vedius had been part of Catiline's two runs of the consulship. Catiline had failed for the last time in 64, trying to become the consul for 63. And that had led to the election of Antonius Hybrida and Cicero. Catiline was bitter about the way that he had lost. He felt like he had been cheated because effectively all of his political opponents had combined to get a rival elected instead of him. And he also felt that it was an active form of discrimination against him because perhaps of his policy or some other reason. Now, running for consul was extremely expensive, and so Catiline had accrued a massive amount of debt, so it was very important for his personal finances that he win. So when he was defeated for a second time, this meant that he was now deeply in debt, and without being consul, without then having a pro-consulship where he could go out and campaign, he would never really have the means to pay this back. This is something that could not only cost him any future opportunities to be consul, but also even maybe his membership in the Senate itself. So for Catiline, he was facing complete and total ruination. And for that reason, among perhaps others, such as having many friends who were deeply indebted, he started to form a conspiracy in 63. During that time, Lucius Vedius was present at his side the entire time, so far as we know. That being said, although Lucius Vedius did turn informant, he was not one of the early people to turn on Catiline, and he also was not necessarily crucial to proving the case. In fact, the most important person in the investigation is an unnamed mistress of one of the conspirators. So many of Catiline's associates were brash young men who would brag to their mistresses about how great they were about to be in the near future, what offices they would hold, how much money they would have. Most of the mistresses didn't really think much of it because this is just how Roman aristocrats are. But one of them figured out that her boyfriend might be a bit unhinged and that his designs might be dangerous and would probably not succeed. So she decided to cash in for herself and went to Cicero with this information. Cicero then began a broad investigation into Catiline and his inner circle and this would eventually net Catiline. Then the two really important pieces of information came from Marcus Licinius Crassus. He found he produced one of them when I believe it was a letter that someone had sent him. He handed that over in October. And the other piece of information was when some Gallic envoys happened to be in town were approached by Catiline's chief lieutenant Lentulus Sura, who was dumb enough to write them a letter with his name and seal on it. So those things really proved the case against Catiline and forced him to flee Rome and try his chances in a field battle. Vedius would eventually testify and confirm that yes, Catiline was plotting to overthrow parts of the Senate, but Vedius tried to do something a little special with his testimony. So rather than just admitting what happened and asking for forgiveness, he instead said, and this conspiracy is far broader than you guys realize. In fact, Caesar over there, the praetor, he's a part of it. And then he named a few other big name senators. So he was trying to effectively spread out the blame. Perhaps this was his way of trying to protect Catiline. Uh, as we'll see though, all he really accomplished was really thoroughly pissing Caesar off. And if it hadn't been for his decision to point fingers at Julius Caesar, Undoubtedly, this particular episode would not have been recorded, and Vedis's name would not have been recorded in connection with the Catalinarian conspiracy. But as it stands, it, he did do that, and he did make history for it. Not only did Lucius Vedius point the finger at Caesar, but he also tried to furnish a piece of evidence that he hoped would prove his claims to be true. He produced a letter that he said that Caesar had written in his own hand to Catiline. The significance of that, of course, is that most Roman senators wrote through their secretaries, and they would only write in their own hand if they're writing to an intimate friend, 
or if it is a matter of great secrecy and they can't risk anyone knowing about it. So the idea is that Caesar and Catiline must be best friends. That being said, most of the people in the Senate who looked at it judged it to be a forgery, and most likely this is because there were a number of people there who knew Caesar's handwriting, and they thought that this was not an actual match. Romans would often send notes across town, invite each other to dinner or whatever, and so people would know, at least a few people in the Senate would know what Caesar's handwriting looked like. Cato actually perhaps would have been the expert on Caesar's handwriting, and we'll get into that in a minute. Now, so this accusation was dismissed effectively, but still, especially for people like Cato, this kind of stuck in their crawl, and they still thought that there might be something fishy about Caesar. So later on in the debate, after they've decided to that the Catalinarians are guilty, uh, this is in Sallust's account of the Catalinarian conspiracy, there's a debate as to how to punish them. And Caesar argues against putting them to death because he says that there would not be a proper legal way to do this for Roman citizens. And so what they need to do is put them under effectively house arrest, but in different areas of Italy. So different towns could hold different conspirators, and this would be a way for these various towns to show their loyalty to Rome by doing something useful. And this was fairly popular as a proposal. Many in the Senate were behind it, but then Cato stood up and kind of gave a blood and gut speech, effectively saying that Caesar must be a Catalinarian. Otherwise, he would see that the right and just and Roman course was to put these traitors to death. So Cato got the entire Senate really furious with Caesar and ready to kill him. So Caesar actually had to be hustled out of the Senate house by Cicero and some guards, and he was in serious danger of losing his life 19 years early. So Cato tried his best to incite a riot among the senators and came pretty close. So for all of the rhetoric about Cato distrusting the mob, it just depended on who was in the mob. If the mob was a, something that consisted of rich people, Cato was all for mob violence. Make no mistake about it. After this incident, of course, Caesar had no way to take vengeance on Cato. Cato was also a magistrate and is not somebody you could just simply uh, jump in an alley. But Vedius was not someone who held an office. His person was not sacrosanct, and so Vedius would have to do as a scapegoat. And of course, this largely was Vedius's fault because Vedius had helped to poison the atmosphere that Cato had then taken advantage of. So, according to Suetonius, Caesar decided to pay Lucius Vedius a visit. And apparently, this is something that magistrates could do when someone had smeared their name. So this was a kind of unofficial punishment for slander. So Caesar and his guys showed up to Vedius's house. They smashed up some of Vedius's belongings. And Caesar then stood idly by, perhaps with a sly grin, and just watched as some of his supporters roughed him up a little bit. And this all took place at a contio, which is a sort of informal gathering. So apparently Caesar also had the backing of a tribune who called for this meeting, and then Caesar could just stand there and get his revenge and defend his name. Perhaps even forced Vedius to admit that Caesar was uninvolved. At any rate, this would be a pretty embarrassing moment for Vedius, and also something that would no doubt produce some bad blood on his part against Caesar. Caesar, of course, would also not trust Vedius, because this had really been a nasty affair for both of them. Caesar had nearly died, and Vedius had also taken some serious blows. His family, if he had one, would have also been terrified by having a mob break into their house and smash their stuff. So a lot of bridges were burned that day. In theory, the tribunes are supposed to look after the safety of the people, so this means that whatever tribune was there calling the contio would have been someone who was clearly in Caesar's pocket. And Caesar, while he was not yet at the height of his powers, was still someone who had formidable political skills and quite a following. So there were still a lot of young men in positions of power who would have been willing to help out Caesar. And Vedius found that out the hard way. Despite a rather unpleasant run-in with Gaius Julius Caesar at Acantio, it has to be said that Lucius Vedius escaped rather lightly from the Catalinarian affair. For starters, he kept his life. He also even kept his property, 
Most of his fellow conspirators were executed without trial, and this would, of course, lead to a lot of legal difficulties for Cicero later, but suffice to say that Vedius could count himself lucky to even still be alive. And yet, he doesn't seem to have really counted his lucky stars or to have learned any kind of prudence from this experience. Rather, he decided to keep doing the same thing and to keep playing the informant and living dangerously. And by 59, the source of the danger had shifted quite a bit because by this time, the brewing conflict between the Optimates and the Populares was finally coming to full maturity. And the Optimates had decided to embrace full-blown obstructionism. So anytime they identified a politician who was popularis, they would obstruct literally everything they tried to do. So any kind of office they run for, they try to obstruct it. Any legislation gets obstructed. Any appointments or settlements uh, get obstructed. And one of the people that they had targeted was none other than Pompey the Great. So Pompey, who had once been the darling of the old Solons, had become something of a pariah to his former friends because of how powerful he had become. So this obstructionism was bad enough that Pompey actually was forced to work with Crassus, his bitter enemy. The two of them had hated each other for years, and they were brought together by Caesar, another person who was being obstructed by the Optimates, and they formed the first triumvirate in early 59. So this was an informal alliance where the three men would use their combined influence to work together to get people elected and pass legislation. And while this was not a, an attack on the Roman constitution because it was an informal arrangement, this was still deeply despised by many of the other senators. And the man who was building a name for himself as a, a very vocal opponent was Gaius Scribonius Curio. His, he had a famous father who was also an outspoken man and a great order, but the younger Curio would actually be the more famous of the two, largely due to his role in the drama leading up to Caesar's Civil War and then his disastrous command in 49. But that's a different story for a different day, and a day not too far off, by the way. Anyhow, um, Curio, as a vehement opponent of the First Triumvirate, was gaining a lot of acclaim in Rome. And so Lucius Vedius approached him with a plot. And he said, I, Lucius Vedius, am planning to murder Pompey, and I want you to help me. So this is a very direct, unsubtle approach, and it might have struck Curio as almost being a trap, because it just seems weird. And also, why would Vedius be leading a plot against Pompey? Vedius is kind of a nobody. He's not on the level to make that kind of a conspiracy. He might join one, but he's certainly not the kind of guy who would lead one. So Curio ultimately was a little bit tempted by the offer because he vehemently hated Pompey, but he ultimately decided he was going to report it to his father to get his advice. And Curio's father, an ex-consul, decided that he needed to go to the Senate with this information. So the two Curios approached the Senate and the Senate immediately summoned Vedius to answer for himself, thus beginning the Vedius affair. Due to the nature of the accusations against him, Lucius Vedius was undoubtedly grabbed by armed guards and hustled to the Senate. And he was then put in front of the Senate and the charges were presented. One has to imagine that Vedius was in no way surprised by the allegations or the person who had brought them. He quickly agreed that he would give up all that he knew, provided that he was offered immunity. And so the Senate agreed to his terms. They figured that he most likely was not that important and that what he would reveal would be far more important than his own criminality. And so they agreed to his conditions and asked him to begin testifying. It's also worth mentioning that the Senate at this time, because of Pompey's significance, was definitely going to investigate this no matter what. Pompey was not only at this time the most prestigious man in Rome because of his many military victories, but he also was actually wealthier than Crassus because he had just conquered much of the East and brought home all kinds of booty. But one of the two consuls was also Gaius Julius Caesar, another triumvir, and a man who was Pompey's father-in-law, 
and at this time the two men were very close. While Pompey and Crassus would never be good friends, Caesar and Pompey actually were good friends, and this would have been about the peak of their friendship in 59. Another thing to keep in mind is that there was a general atmosphere of suspicion when it came to people fearing that Pompey's life was in danger. And the person who had actually revealed the existence of another plot was someone who was a known and very vocal opponent of Caesar and Pompey, and that would be Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus, the other consul. Um, so he had actually approached Pompey with rumors that there was a plot afoot. And so once Curio comes and says that he had word from Vedius that there's yet another plot, this is something that is going to build into that general feeling that there are people plotting against Pompey and this needs to be taken very seriously. And so the combination of these factors, Pompey's allies being in key positions, his own importance, and pre-existing rumors meant that Vedius's accusations were going to be listened to very carefully. Immediately upon receiving the Senate's protection, Vedius began to deliver his testimony. To put it politely, this went exceedingly poorly. Vedius started out by effectively claiming that the whole thing was a setup because, in fact, the leader of the conspiracy was none other than his accuser, Curio the Younger. Curio the Younger was the mastermind of the entire plot to kill Pompey. And in addition to himself, Curio could count upon the support of other young, hot-blooded aristocrats with conservative leanings, men such as Lucius Aemilius Paulus, a rising star in the Senate, and Marcus Junius Brutus, who at this point would have still been a teenager. Aemilius Paulus, by the way, is the older brother of the future triumvir Marcus Aemilius Lepidus. So Vedius was naming these guys, and someone must have asked them, well, sur surely they have support from someone a little higher ranking. And Vedius says, well, they certainly do, as a matter of fact. Curio's father is a member, as is the consul Bibulus. Bibulus is also a big part of this conspiracy. One of the senators then pointed out that there was a bit of a problem with this list of suspects, namely that Paulus was currently in Macedonia and had been for several months. So he hasn't been attending any meetings. There's no way he could have unless he could astrally project. Another matter that then was brought up was that when Vedius was arrested, he was found wearing a dagger. Technically, wearing a dagger was illegal. You're not supposed to have edged weapons within the Palmarium around Rome. And Vedius's response as to where he got the dagger and why he was wearing it is that he had received it that very morning from Bibulus's servants. And the entire Senate erupted in laughter because they thought that this was the height of ridiculousness, that there's no way that's true. And also just that it's comical, the idea that he couldn't have possibly found a dagger without the help of Bibulus. Because although these things were banned from the city, they were still very abundant and cheap. And for someone with the means of Bibulus, I mean of uh, Vedius, even if he wasn't at the very, very tip top of Roman society, he still could have afforded as many daggers as he wanted, and it would not have set him back that much relative to his means. Vedius ended up being detained for the night, probably in the forum, chained in a cell right below the ground. There weren't very many facilities for keeping prisoners in the ancient world in general, but there were a few cells in the forum, and the main purpose of this was just to humiliate him for his ridiculous testimony and also for carrying a deadly weapon in the city. They had promised him protection, so they couldn't really be too harsh, and you might think this would be where it ends, with Vedius once again being humiliated after trying to play politics and playing it very poorly. But no, he wasn't done. After having an entire night to himself in the forum, Vedius was summoned from his cell and taken to a contio presided over by the tribune Publius Vitinius. Vitinius was a close ally of Caesar and would later become a major force in Roman politics in his own right. For now, though, he and Caesar were interested in getting more information out of Vedius. And so, at a contio, 
Phidias was asked to testify and name more names and give more details. One has to imagine that when Vidius saw Caesar at this event, he most likely thought back to four years before, the last time they'd been in the Contio together, and perhaps he thought this was not going to go particularly well. Vidius decided to really shift the focus of his accusations. He actually dropped charges against Bibulus and Brutus. So he said the current consul Bibulus and young Brutus were not involved, and instead he decided to go after some more established optimates, some of the major players who were semi-retired and some of the senior men in the Senate. Among them were the general Lucius Licinius Lucullus, who at this time was probably the most prestigious man in the faction, Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus, a rising star who would be consul in 54, Gaius Fanius, who had a grandfather who had been consul during the time of Gaius Gracchus, so he was a major player in that conservative movement. There's Gaius Calpurnius Piso, a former consul from 67. There is Marcus Juventius Laterensis, a person we covered fairly recently, who was pre during 51. And while he didn't say the name Cicero, Vidius did say that another member of this conspiracy was a certain eloquent ex-consul. All of these men were accused of being a part of this grand plot against Pompey. Vitinius continued to ask for more names, and he promised the crowd that he would form a special tribunal to investigate all of Vidius's claims and get to the bottom of this. He would protect their beloved Pompey. And keep in mind, at this time, Pompey was very, very popular with the common people in Rome because of all the benefactions that he had brought to the city due to his various campaigns. So the next day looked like it would be more of the same, with Vitinius summoning Vidius yet again to name more names and give more details, and also to begin to summon witnesses and make all the spectacle out of this. But it wasn't to be. The morning after he testified at Vitinius's contio, Lucius Vidius was found dead in his cell in the forum. The official report is that he died of natural causes. Now exactly who determined this and how they did it, I don't know. Or how many doctors were present, or how much independence they had. In general, doctors were not people of very high social status in the Roman world, and so they would be told what to find or they might give their findings and then whoever was in charge of the investigation would write down whatever they pleased. It is possible, of course, that he did die of natural causes suddenly. This was not unknown in the ancient world. There was no way to really diagnose underlying conditions such as uh, defective heart valves or something else that could really pop up when one is under stress and result in a seemingly sudden and random death. That being said, um, most likely, as I mentioned, Vidius was a fairly young man, perhaps around 30 years old, and it's unlikely that he would have just killed over even if he was under stress. We don't know what season it was. Most likely it was still early in the consulship of Caesar and Bibulus, or as most people preferred to call it, Julius and Caesar, just because of how much Caesar sidelined Bibulus. Um, if it was early in the year, it could have still been chilly, that being said, Roman winters usually aren't that harsh, and it probably probably would not be a killing cold for a rather young man who was an equestrian and therefore would have had the proper nutrition, so he was not some sort of starving person with uh, nourishment-related issues. And because of all of this, most Romans took it as a matter of fact that despite the official report, Vidius must have been murdered by someone who wanted to shut him up. And most scholars have followed that line of thinking. I've never read anyone who thinks that Vidius killed over of natural causes. Um, Jeremiah McCall in a recent book in 2022 says as a matter of fact, just simply, that Vidius was strangled. However, I am of the mind that a more probable way to take out Vidius would have been through poison, since that would have been harder to trace than strangulation. Strangulation obviously would leave marks, especially if it was done by a professional assassin with a garrote. Um, that being said, 
any number of methods could have been administered, and given both the lack of forensic investigative skills at the time and the fact that Vedius was not exactly a beloved figure, combined with a strong prejudice against informants, it was pretty unlikely that anyone would do a thorough investigation into Vedius' death. And so long as he wasn't simply soaked in a pool of his own blood, people would be content to say, oh, look, he's dead, moving on. Or at least the powers that be investigating the cell would be content to say that and then move on. But of course, that leaves all kinds of questions unanswered. Who killed this man? How did they do it? And also, what was he even doing in the first place? What were his motives? What was he up to? So many unanswered questions, and I'm going to try to answer some of them, although as we'll see, there aren't really any definitive answers. Let's begin by considering the possibility that Lucius Vedius was acting as an agent for a more powerful political player. Since antiquity, the leading suspect for the role of puppet master has been Gaius Julius Caesar. The primary reason why he has been suspect number one is because he was Cicero's leading suspect and Cicero has survived in a greater quantity than any other source. Many classicists, especially up until about the 1960s, would simply reproduce Cicero's opinions and state them as hard and fast facts. For Cicero, Caesar was clearly guilty. He wrote to his friend Atticus that Caesar had put Vedius up to this whole thing and that the entire purpose of Vedius's testimony on both days was purely to smear the younger Curio. And the purpose was to clip Curio's wings. Curio was being too critical of Caesar's consulship and of the first triumvirate, and Caesar simply wanted to put the young man in his place. That seems like an awful lot of trouble to go to to try to correct a younger senator in that way, especially if you're going to really broaden the scope of that so much. Nonetheless, this is what Cicero believed, and perhaps he was also motivated by the fact that he was good friends with Curio and his father, and was very much looking out for the interest of Curio. Cicero, in a public speech, where he would be less candid about his reasons, of course, and also less trustworthy, since he's simply trying to persuade an audience, uh, he gave a speech against Vitinius in Vitinium in 56 as a part of a larger defense of Publius Cestius. Cicero says that Vitinius had acted as Vedius' handler three years earlier, and the purpose of this is to discredit him as a witness. The idea is that Vitinius stage-managed all of Vedius' testimony, especially on the second day, in order to create conditions for him to hold a special tribunal and make a name for himself as tribune. The whole purpose of this was to try to discredit Vitinius as a witness to help out Cestius. That being said, Cicero might have actually believed this to some extent given his other beliefs about, C about Caesar and his involvement with Vedius. That being said, it seems like Cicero is making a bit of a stretch for rhetorical purposes here. But some scholars have thought of these things as being t things that should be taken literally and as fact. Caesar and his associate Vitinius also had presided over the Contio on the second day, so perhaps they had gone to him beforehand to arrange what he would say. One of the more suspicious aspects of the change in Vidius's testimony is that Brutus, the son of Caesar's mistress Servilia, was dropped from the list of conspirators. Bibulus, the co-consul, was also dropped, although Caesar would have no real reason to want to help out Bibulus because the two men had hated each other their entire lives. In general, it's also worth mentioning as a piece of supporting evidence that actually kind of helps, Caesar, almost uniquely, was willing to let bygones be bygones and to work with former enemies. For instance, he had always been at odds with the younger Curio, but the two of them reconciled and Curio became one of his commanders during the Civil War. So Caesar was someone who was willing to move on and align with people he had previously had issues with, and to do so in a fairly open-minded and open-handed way. In terms of the case against Caesar being the puppet master, um, of course, obviously, there had been a lot of previous beef between Caesar and Vedius over what had happened in 63. And another thing is that this was a very sloppy affair. 
Vedius was clearly not the most reliable witness, and it's hard for me to imagine Caesar trying to orchestrate something so messy and just so unyieldy. Now, perhaps this was a Vatinius-led operation, and this was Vatinius's idea, and Caesar was just backing him up, but I definitely don't see the mind of Caesar as the planning force behind this whole thing. Now, could he have been involved? Of course, but personally, knowing what I know of the figures of this time, I just don't see Caesar as the most likely suspect. Caesar is still far and away the favorite suspect of most scholars. That being said, some modern scholars such as Eric Gruen and Robert Morstein Marx have mentioned, at least in passing, that Pompey should be considered a possible suspect as the puppet master behind Vedius. They don't quite do enough legwork to explain why, but I can fill in the gaps and make a case for them. Vedius's accusations really highlighted a supposed danger to Pompey's person, and perhaps he thought that this would help to bolster his popularity, or at least to show it to his allies and his enemies. So it would show Caesar, the current consul, and also Crassus, who was still someone that Pompey didn't personally like or trust, that he was the glue that held the triumvirate together. It was his popularity, above all else, that made what they did possible. He was the man in Rome. The people loved him. And so if the people would show up and support him and offer him bodyguards and all kinds of other honors because of some half-baked conspiracy, then they better be weary of betraying him in any way. This also would send a message to his former allies, the Optimates, that he had always been the shining star of the Solon Order. And now, because they had turned their back on him, he was taking the people's support with him and siding with the Populares, and they could only blame themselves for betraying him. And they best not mess with him, because if they inspire his ire enough, he might just have to summon the crowd on them. So this could actually serve a lot of purposes in terms of just showing Pompey's strength as a political actor. A lot of people tend to discount Pompey's political skills because he wasn't the best orator, and occasionally some of the subtleties of Roman politics would be lost in him, but he actually is more as someone with more guile than I think is generally recognized. And certainly he would have been smart enough to pull something like this off. Another possible motive for Pompey would be to try to deflect criticism that the triumvirs were thuggish and tended to rely on force to get their way. Of course, they had formed the triumvirate in the first place in order to override obstructionism. But behind that obstructionism was the constant threat of violence. The ancestors of the Optimates, their grandfathers, had effectively defined themselves by their willingness to kill the Gracchi and inflict violence to uh, push the interest of the Senate above that of other classes. And so this was something that modern Optimates were well aware of, and oftentimes they would engage in bloody rhetoric, especially we had an example earlier when Cato called for Caesar's death in the Senate in 63. And so this was a way to remind people that while the triumvirs were willing to resort to force, this wasn't necessarily their fault and they certainly were not unique in their use of force. In fact, if anything, they were less murderous than the Optimates. So Pompey actually had plenty of reasons to potentially go out and spread a conspiracy theory that there was a plot against his life. He could actually benefit from it more than a lot of people. I would like to make a few minor notes before we get into what I think is the third major possibility. One thing that scholars often overlook is that actions by Pompey and Caesar are not necessarily mutually exclusive given how close they were in 59. It's possible that both of them work together on the Vedius issue, and it's even possible, of course, that Crassus was involved in some way, but managed to keep himself hidden. We know that Crassus had a reputation for being involved in a lot of smoky rooms, I guess you could call it, and he was often suspected of being behind all kinds of things. So Crassus is another suspect that we have no real evidence for. Uh, Caesar and Pompey could have been cooperating. Another Possibility is that actually Vedius was put up to this or at least fed false information by Optimates. Maybe they wanted 
this information to get out there so that way people would be inspired to join them or other optimites would find the guts to more openly and bloodily oppose the triumvirate if they thought that some young guy like Curio was willing to go out and risk his promising career and his very life to try to preserve liberty by killing Pompey, who would upset the Apple Carter Roman politics. All of those are possibilities, I would say. But a more likely possibility than most of those, and something that I believe deserves equal billing with Caesar and Pompey as puppet master, is the more simple possibility that Vedius was acting on his own accord. And no one's really thought about this much up to this point. It may have been the case that he actually was genuine when he approached Curio. He was trying to put together a conspiracy to kill Pompey. Perhaps he genuinely thought, for whatever reason, that if he simply killed Pompey, Rome would be fixed. And while that might seem simplistic and ridiculous, a lot of Romans felt that way. Just think about the Ides of March. Many of the conspirators were convinced that all they had to do was kill Caesar, and then everything that Caesar had ever done would be undone, and things would go back to normal. The Senate would move on, everybody would be fine, etc. Vedius then, once he gets hauled before the Senate, may have decided to just start naming names, just point to high-ranking people, accuse them of being involved in some conspiracy, and hope that their enemies would support him. He had learned his lesson about Caesar, obviously, because Caesar had struck back, so he decided maybe this time I'll try to court Caesar by naming Caesar's enemies. So that's kind of what he does. And then that night, he may have been approached by Caesar and Vitinius and decided to just go with what they wanted. But the reason why I think he might have been a free agent, that he might have just simply been a wild card, is that his claims are inconsistent between the first and the second day. And they also seem kind of improvised. The fact that he named Lucius Aemilius Paulus really stands out, because had he been remotely serious, he would have known that Aemilius Paulus was not even in town. He was probably just trying to name well-known, outspoken, young, aristocratic senators. And Aemilius Paulus, naming him was a huge mistake. Or the detail about this dagger supposedly coming from Bibulus' servant was also weird and unbelievable. So to me, this points to Vedius probably acting at least to some extent on his own, or perhaps being a puppet, but being one who really wasn't very good at following orders. And perhaps that's why someone eventually decided to have him put out of his misery, because he had failed them in some way. Or perhaps someone simply thought that Vedius, for whatever reason, was a threat to their position. So we'll never really know exactly who was pulling the strings behind Vedius, if anyone actually was. So let's move to the equally thorny and unanswerable question, who done it? Who killed Lucius Vedius? Given how popular true crime is on YouTube, I'm about to ask a question that many entire channels hinge upon. Who was the murderer? Or in this case, a more precise way to phrase it would be, who paid the murderer of Lucius Vedius? Again, I have to acknowledge there is a non-zero chance that Vedius did indeed die of natural causes due to exposure to the elements or some unknown medical condition, but most likely he was murdered by someone. The classic explanation from Cicero is that Caesar had, of course, trotted out Lucius Vedius with promises, had him smear Curio, Bibulus, and some others, and then put him to death once he had outlived his usefulness. It's possible that was the case, and we know for sure that Caesar had the ruthlessness required to be a murderer. He often liked to show his clemency toward men who were honorable, or perceived as honorable, but there would really be no reason to try to save the life of Vedius and make a real friend out of him because Vedius was seen as scum of the earth by most. Most common Romans and most senators saw informants as absolute scum. So Caesar could easily use and abuse Vedius in that way. He certainly probably still hated him, 
because of what Vidius had, all, had done to him four years earlier. That being said, there are a lot of other potential suspects to consider. In fact, every single person named by Vidius as a conspirator had a motive and would have been vicious enough to put the man to death. Even young Brutus, who was still in his teenage years or very early 20s, had a vicious streak. He would later charge 48% interest and illegal amount to earthquake victims. And of course, he would put a dagger in Caesar and uh, do it to someone after they had pardoned him and all that. So Brutus, even Brutus, noble Brutus as he was sometimes called, had a well-known vicious streak. If we think about some of the other guys involved, Bibulus had already suffered enough indignities. Perhaps he had had enough and decided to avenge himself on someone he could actually get to. Um, Lucullus, the old stalwart of the Optimate cause and a man who was the darling of the Sullen cause before Pompey literally stole one of his commands and took all the credit, um, he clearly did hate Pompey. And perhaps when he was named, he felt like this made him seem bitter of Pompey, as if he envied Pompey and wanted to be more like him. And so perhaps Lucullus was just offended by that very notion so much that he decided to go after the man who might have created it in someone's mind. And these might seem like petty motives. But we have to remember, these are petty men. Roman aristocrats would pull out a dagger and stab someone over some fairly minor things. This was especially true of younger aristocrats, but even older ones were very willing to resort to violence if it was a matter of honor. And while they would be somewhat cautious when dealing with equals, when it came to dealing with someone who was a step below them, especially someone who bore the taint of being an informant, it would be very hard for them to refrain from violence. That would be the challenge, would be that for them not to result, resort to violence. And it would be very rare for them to be punished for inflicting violence unless they did it in an official capacity. Um, however, my favorite suspect for being Vidius's murderer is none other than Gnaeus Pompey the Great, the ostensible target of the conspiracy. And my reasons for thinking that he is the hatchet man is that he had a long history, going back decades at this time, of engaging in ruthless behavior and exterminating his enemies with extreme prejudice. So back in 78, when he had put down the revolt of Lepidus, he had killed the father of Brutus the assassin, Marcus Junius Brutus, on his own orders. He had pardoned the man, sort of. He had accepted his surrender and sent him under honorable guard to another town, and then he sent an assassin after him. And he never explained his reasons for doing so. He simply decided to do it. And when the Senate asked him why he did it, he just said, well, I felt like it would be in the best interest of Rome. I just did it. Um, so that's by that point, he had become well known as the boy butcher. He was willing to execute people rapidly and without much uh, conscience. Later on in the late 70s, he had gone to Spain to fight Quintus Sertorius. He had suborned the subordinate general Perperna. Perperna had then murdered Sertorius and that made all of uh, Sertorius's papers available to Pompey. And rather than looking through this correspondence to look for letters from senators back in Rome who may have been um, sympathetic, Pompey decided an act that he tried to play off as magnanimous to burn all the papers. Was that an act where he was trying to be generous toward people back in Rome and sort of let bygones be bygones? Or was there something there that incriminated him or one of his friends? We'll never know. Pompey took it upon himself to end situations and thought that he had the judgment to just simply make determinations that I'm sure a whole lot of people in the Senate would want to have a voice in. So Pompey was known for doing shady stuff that involved killing people and destroying evidence, and he had never in the past shown any inclination to hesitate. So if he either believed Vedius's accusations, or if he were behind Vedius, either way, if he thought that things had played out, he would eliminate Vedius. We also need to remember that um, any explanations that involve Caesar or Pompey 
don't have to be mutually exclusive because, again, they were very close in 59. Uh, Caesar had actually married his daughter off to Pompey, and the two of them were getting along very well. So at this time, the relationship was golden, and it would not be until several years later that they would start to have tension once Caesar's prestige started to equal that of Pompey. But so long as Pompey was the clear leader of the triumvirate, he and Caesar got along just fine. If we're looking for the legacy and significance of Lucius Vedius and his accusations, we have to keep in mind that we might need to look for more indirect results rather than direct results. The reason I say that is because, as Morstein Marx noted in 2021, Vedius's accusations back in 59 had really failed to spur a strong response. And most likely that means that people had simply not taken Vedius's claims all that seriously. That he was seen as a crank and a crackpot, and that his word shouldn't be taken as credible information. That being said, while Vedius was not taken all that seriously by most of the powers that be in Rome, and there were no direct results of his accusations, I would argue that he did help to further poison the well and really make sure that the 50s were an era of bitter, brutal political competition with no holds barred. The 50s were an era where people tended to believe a lot of conspiracies and really fight in an all-out way on the political front. There were even street gangs under Clodius and Milo competing for influence. There are all kinds of legal irregularities, from the Bona, uh, Bonadia affair to uh, Clodius being adopted into a plebeian family so he could use the powers of the, tribune, the tribunate. Um, all kinds of things happened in the 50s that were basically unthinkable even in the tumultuous decades before. And Vedius's affair, the Vedius affair itself might have been a minor chapter in that, but it still helped to really set the tone, both for Caesar's consulship and for the entire decade that followed. So, in a small way, Lucius Vedius, the equestrian who was probably always broke and always on the outside of Roman politics looking in, actually did end up having a fairly major impact on Roman history, even if it's one that perhaps no one would envy him because he came across as a complete lunatic and really embarrassed himself on a number of occasions. Nonetheless, he did help to really poison the well of Roman politics and make things that much more bitter and partisan and bloody. Until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian, and this is probably about the closest thing I'll ever do to a true crime episode. Peace out.